Is a participatory economy really practical or is it just a pipe dream? Find out in this episode of Pep Talk. Could you please tell us um, what you see as the alternative? Hello and welcome to Pep Talk the podcast where we discuss the democratic alternative to capitalism known as a participatory economy. I'm your host, Mitchell Strapanchik, coming to you from Chicago. Um, in this episode, we will discuss the topic of the practicality question. How practical the, is, is a participatory economy and what exactly does that mean in related topics? We're joined by Robin Hanel, one of the co-inventors of the model of a participatory economy, and Antti Jauhainen, scholar, activist, teacher, um, a writer. So Robin, let's begin with you. You discuss about what's referred to as the practicality question, but there's a specific meaning about that that might not be implied but from, a, from the word that where people typically think of as practicality. Could you explain more about what's meant by that and what we talk about at, in the context of a participatory economy? Well, the, the issue, our proposal is that we have a planned economy um, and that we, we have investment planning, we have long run development planning, but that we also have, that we also do annual plans and that we not allow markets and market forces um, to determine outcomes. Um, and particularly, you know, since the, the demise of the, of the centrally planned economies in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, there's been a tremendous amount of skepticism about whether any sort of comprehensive planning, particularly you know, annual planning at any sort of detailed level is a practical possibility. Um, certainly all those who propose an alternative to capitalism that is some form of market socialism, one of their primary arguments is that it's just impractical not to have markets. So we can have a market system because it's necessary, it's convenient, and we can just make sure that the markets are, are rendered harmless. We can try and combat their, you know, their, their, their various negative effects. Um, there were there were people there were of course there were many people arguing this before the demise of the Soviet Union and the centrally planned economies there and in Eastern Europe. Alec Nov was famous for basically saying, "Look, there's only two alternatives: you have some form of command planning, like they had in the Soviet Union, or you have a market system." So, we've basically been in a minority on that subject. Um, that's been. <clears throat> That's been the dominant view on the left, even amongst those who say we'd like to have an alternative to capitalism. Um, and early on, we basically said, um, we don't think that there's overwhelming evidence that you know a comprehensive planning system is impossible, is impractical. And we also think that it's possible that it be a system in which workers in their own councils and consumers in their own councils um, are the ones that are doing the planning, that it's not some form of central bureaucracy doing the planning. So this has been a big issue. Um, and we made a lot of progress for many, many years in terms of developing a theoretical model and a proposal that we analyzed in theory and what the properties of this proposal this planning procedure would be in theory. And we demonstrated in theory, a lot of you know, very positive results. And so in theory, we presented our proposal as an alternative to central planning, as well as an alternative to a market economy. But that didn't mean that there weren't skeptics you know, who said, well, maybe in theory, you've shown that this would be wonderful. Um, but that, you know, theory is not the same as in the real words. Theory is not the same in practice. Um, I mean, one particular voice of skepticism, you know, a, a close friend of mine, a, a socialist feminist economist, Nancy Fulbright, um, she expressed it as, you know, the problem here is that you're just going to have the tyranny of the sociable tied up in endless meetings. And, you know, anybody... Anybody who fears that the planning would go on forever, um, it would never come to an end. 
it's just impractical, as nice as it sounds in theory. Um, this was always something that, you know, was it, it was always something that was a, that was that was a problem that people posed whenever we talked about our alternative. So there's only so many ways that you can test this. The obvious way to test this would be some country adopts this system of planning, puts it into effect, and we find out whether it's a practical possibility. Um, but no country has been willing to do that. So is there anything else you can do to try and shed some light on whether or not this planning procedure would be practical? And, and I want to also introduce a different word, robust. So <clears throat> one issue is you have every economist, any economist has to make assumptions um, about production functions and and, and the preferences of consumers in order to make a, in order to model and draw conclusions about what would happen. But everybody knows those assumptions we make will be violated in the real world. I mean, one common one, one example of an assumption is, well, we assume that you know, we don't have increasing economies to scale. Well, everybody knows, but in some places you do have you do have increasing economies to scale. So there were two is two outstanding issues. One was with the number of me with the number of meetings or in our annual planning procedure, the number of iterations, the number of times that each council would have to propose something and then revise it. Would that just become impractical? For example, suppose it takes 500 revisions of proposals that all the workers' councils and the consumer councils have to go through before reaching this annual plan. Well, I would consider that impractical. That's not something that's likely to be very practical in the real world. And the second issue was, well, if some of the key assumptions that economists have to make, all economists have to make whenever modeling any kind of economic system, when those key assumptions break down, would that basically disrupt the annual planning procedure to the point where it would break down and it would not reach a feasible plan? And so <clears throat> it took us many decades to, to, to raise some money, get some grants, and put together you know, the beginnings of how you would answer these doubts. And the way we did it was they said, well, we're going to simulate. We are going to simulate the annual planning procedure with a large number of councils of different kinds, and we're going to see how many times, how many iterations, how many times would they have to revise proposal and resubmit proposals before they reached a plan? And then the second thing we said was, and then we'll go ahead and start breaking the convenient assumptions that all economists make and see whether or not that disrupts our annual planning procedure. And we finally finished enough of that work and Mitchell played a you know the key role in as as the programmer we finally we finally finished enough work on that subject and ran enough experiments to go ahead and publish our preliminary results about how practical and robust does our does this annual participatory planning appear to be and i i mean i will be the first to say i was very surprised I did not think that our computer simulation results were going to result in, we're going to suggest that the procedure is far more practical and far more robust than if you had asked me when we started, it would prove to be. Um, so in some sense, I think we, from the point of view of those of us who've said, skeptics who think this is going to be impractical, no matter how pretty it looks in theory. Um, it's, it's fine to be skeptical. It's important to have people who are asking questions like that. But so far, we believe the evidence is that, that it's more practical than, than, than even we imagined, much less those who said you just can't avoid markets or you have to turn it over to some sort of central planning bureaucracy. Um, this is where a little bit of my, I'm going to be um, putting on my hat as that of a computer programmer, because that's been, I guess, my job now for more than two decades. Um, but also um, fortunate that I can leverage those skills and that knowledge base into this kind of work to answer a critical question regarding 
um, a future economy like this. Um, uh, you raised the points, Robin, regarding a um, the practicality question of how many iterations it takes and the robustness question of what do we do when the, does it work when the assumptions break down or when they get changed around in, in inconvenient ways. Um, in, uh, and also for the benefit of viewers and listeners regarding this podcast, um, it, Robin and I had done a fair amount of work on this over the span of nearly three years um, before ultimately um, publishing the work. And um, it seemed to me like more time was spent on the practicality question than, than on the robustness question. We did spend some time on the robustness question where we did muck up the assumptions in order to see things to make sure that they worked. It, it, and, they, and they did to my surprise. Um, that's actually a very encouraging sign, I would think. Um, but it seems like that there's more to do on that robustness question, at least in my mind, than on the practicality question. Still a lot to do regarding on the practicality question, but it felt to me like we spent a lot more time on researching the practicality, the number of iterations to make sure that it was like reasonable, like maybe about less than 10 it would be what I would count as reasonable, um, or at least within that vicinity, rather than hundreds or thousands or millions. Um, but then the robustness question to make sure what if we were to change the assumptions, would this still would it still work? Would it still lead to a whole lot of iterations taking a long time? It felt to me like yes, we touched on that, but nowhere near to the extent on the practicality question. Um, Auntie, uh, as a detached observer of the discussion that Robin and I have been talking about, but also um, in the fact that we both have something of a we've been working pretty closely on this for a number of years. What is your take on seeing this as someone who has not been as deeply involved on this? You're encouraged, I would take, but what are your thoughts? Well, it's um, actually nice to remember way back in 2014, I think, when um, Robin gave a presentation at University of Helsinki, a very early uh, version of, of simulation models of participatory economy. Uh, and I remember that it, it raised very sort of uh, interested discussion on uh, on these kind of alternatives from anyone interested in economics in general because it is this kind of work that is first of all uh, in general in economics uh, useful um, but I think when it comes to alternatives I think it's very important and basically our only tool like Robin said of showing that there is a high level of feasibility to these plans. And I think it's a, a good way in general of, I think, discussion on economic alternatives to capitalism should try to, you know, achieve at this, at least this level of sort of competence and feasibility that they can be proven in theory, as has been done with participatory economy. And that to me is, um, is I think uh, I'm I'm in camp in the same camp as Robin that when he first showed it, um, I was skeptical. Uh, but also I think even for a layman such as myself, um, it helped to sort of visualize and make concrete like what what would these iterations mean, how you know cumbersome would it be, uh, and how much it would actually I think help. Um, the planning of economy and how I think I think the big discussion with with this is that you know we should have more planning in our economy. Uh, we don't want the chaos of markets or or you know the simple rule of those of those uh, richest people or richest entities in society overruling everything. Instead, we want to have more planning in our economy. Then the second question comes: What kind of planning? And I hope uh, that the answer would be that we don't want central planning. Unfortunately, I think a lot of people on the left and on the right as well, I think, uh, flirt with ideas of centrally planned economy in one way or another. Um, and I think that's why a push for, for, you know, credible democratic alternatives uh, that openly and explicitly talk about planning is is needed. Uh, another thing when it comes to, you know, making a yearly plan for an economy, making uh, an actual, you know, 
uh, uh, the economy, wide plan for the economy, is important in a sense that uh, oftentimes any alternative to capitalism faces the question of bureaucracy or is it cumbersome, like like Robin said, and it often sidesteps how convoluted and how strange and how also in many places centrally planned our economies currently are you know when you consider companies like amazon and walmart and so on there's huge amounts of planning uh, a lot of uh, straight up you know old school central planning then all sort of algorithmic planning as well um and uh and saying that you know alternatives are hugely bureaucratic uh they sort of miss that have you ever looked around what's going on for example netflix has to do you know separate uh negotiations their legal teams have to do separate negotiations with all the companies every year on what tv shows what movies are present on netflix but not just with the companies but they have to do that with every country that netflix is in and they have to do with the representatives of all those companies in all those different countries and it's just huge amount of you know bureaucracy huge amount of basically planning iterations you know deals going back and forth and so on um so i think one of the you know many benefits of of this simulation this simulation work is that i think it's more and more also brings into discussion all sorts of planning that is currently present in our economy and and should be discussed more and then again you know the participatory economy has been at the forefront this discussion, I think, for a, for a pretty long time, for such a small, small model. Understandably, there is the focus and there are a number of advantages to building this out as a computer program. We can do it. We don't have to wait. We can work out, you know, mathematical models that we can code up and we can demonstrate. We can share um, both the source code as well as the data that were used. And if people feel like, well, I still don't believe you, then you can build their own, they can adapt from the code, um, they can take our data and try to replicate the examples themselves. But I wonder if, and this is where I would like to take this discussion now, maybe we're relying too much on computer code in order to try to answer these questions. Robin had started off in his, uh, in, and mentioned in his uh, earlier remarks about seeing if we could get a country, some perhaps some small country, perhaps a bigger one, who knows, that might take these ideas and say, let's try to implement this ourselves. Do we count that as a viable option or is that just at least for the time being and maybe for the foreseeable future, um, not an option? Robin, what are your thoughts? I think that is an option. Um, it obviously has advantages above and beyond what simulation has. Um, I mean, of course it's better to test something out in the real world and see how it works out than it is to do computer simulations where we basically give worker councils production functions, we give consumer councils utility functions, and we then go ahead and simulate what they would do when they are trying to sort of maximize things from their own point of view during a planning process. In, in 1990, I mean, I, I, have, I have visited Cuba a couple of times. And in 1990, um, I was invited down there. Um, well, I was actually invited down in 1989, and that's part of the story. Um, and I was invited down because they, they people, in the, people in the Cuban government and the planning ministry had read something about participatory planning. Um, they, I think very wisely, were aware of the fact that the old system of central planning they inherited from the Soviet Union back in the early 60s um, was clunky and was not something that they were altogether happy with. And they were interested in exploring possible alternatives. Um, the simple way of putting it is, they were aware that they needed to breathe some life you know, into their planning procedure and in some way to encourage both consumers and workers to be more enthusiastic about participating. Um, now, unfortunately, when I got there, I, so I was invited down to consult, you know, to, to work as a consultant 
both at the university, you know, in the economics department at the planning ministry. Um, but if everybody remembers what happened in 1990, that was when Soviet Union collapsed. And by the time I got there, every economist in Cuba was trying to figure out we are, we are so tied in with trade agreements with Eastern European countries and, and, and Russia that we are going to have a very, very difficult time just surviving over the next time period. Um, and they sort of, so everybody I was supposed to meet with about their planning system and ways that they might want to do something else. What I wanted, what I went down to propose was that they set up a trial system um, of doing the plan both their way and doing a plan this new way, this more participatory way. Um, and everybody I was supposed to talk to, all they wanted to do was ask me, well, you're an economist. How are we going to survive the fact that, you know, all of the imports that we were expecting to get from the Eastern Europe are not arriving on the ships anymore? And, and I had to tell them, you've got the wrong economist. That's not my specialty. I don't think I have any better advice to give you than a bunch of other economists and you yourselves. And indeed, they went, I mean, Cuba went through, they, they called it the, they had a special name for it. Um, but they went through a period of time for two or three years in the early 90s where their GDP dropped by almost a half. So this was real, you know, serious economic hardship. Um, but it sort of disrupted what at the time was interest in Cuba. Um, later, I was invited down to Venezuela um, during the Chavez years. Um, and the Venezuelan government who was very, I mean, they were very friendly with Cuba and, and Hugo Chavez was very friendly with Fidel Castro and, and Fidel and, and, and Chavez was very, very plain. He told the Cubans, we're not interested in your advice about how to do economic planning because we don't like your system. And I have it on good authority that Fidel Castro actually told Chavez, you're right. <laughs> Take our advice on other subjects, but not that. And so there was a period of time in the early 2000s. I was down there twice consulting in, in, in Venezuela. And what I was trying to talk to them about was, all right, you've rejected the Cuban system as an alternative to capitalism. What other alternatives are there? We talked about participatory economics, but the political situation in Venezuela has evolved to the point where now they are in, you know, they're increasingly in economic crisis. They are increasingly in no position where they can be talking about sort of a, a, large, a large change in an entire system of economic planning, you know, to adopt. So I, I continue to believe that when anti-capitalists come to power anywhere and face the dilemma of what are we going to do? There's an increasing consensus that nobody wants to do central planning anymore. And then there are all these alternatives that people are basically proposing. And I think what's happening over time is, and what we're attempting to do through other means, um, such as the simulations, is to present evidence that what I believe is the basic vision of early socialists going back to the, to, you know, to more than a hundred years ago that what we really want is a system where workers in their own councils and consumers in their own neighborhoods and councils, they plan their interrelated economic activities together. And what we face is centuries of people saying this is impossible. I mean, some people say it's undesirable, but even people who are attracted, you know, by the notion that, that that's how humans should be, making decisions about their interrelated economic activities, even those who are attracted to that notion over, you know, over many, many decades now have come to be skeptical about, is it really possible? And we increasingly are providing, I think, more evidence that that early vision is not in fact impossible at all. Up until now, you know, no country or no government has been willing to either try it out in reality or even try it out as a, we're going to do our one plan, we're going to do our economy our way we've been doing it, and then we're going to also have people in our real economy 
doing the things that you are proposing they do instead to see what the you know to see what kind of difference in results there are that's the halfway ground between simulation and just whole scale adopting this you know and putting it into effect for the actual for the entire economy so that's 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 the area in which we still find ourselves um but i think the simulations are a huge step you know in terms of being able to provide some very credible evidence and we and we should go over a little bit what the results are i mean the the bottom line is what we discovered is that our evidence based on you know hundreds and hundreds of experimental runs is that it it looks like it would not take more than 6 or 7 or 8 rounds of proposals and modifications in order for a country i mean we we simulated a number of people in a number of councils you know that would be approximately the size of the swedish economy approximately the size of the economy of peru so we're talking about real world size economies um and what we discovered is that it does not look like it would take more than six or seven iterations and it also looks like even when you break down some key assumptions about things like returns to scale that it does not disrupt the planning procedure that we've that we've proposed so it's almost i mean i find myself in this regard it's almost our results are so good that they're almost embarrassing they're almost you know they lack credibility because they are so much better than even the people who were proposing this thought they were going to be um now that's one reason that you continue to do more work and and you know Mitchell and I and other people you know are continuing we know that there's more simulation to work that can be done to sort of flesh this out um particularly on robustness as as Mitchell said um and we're hopeful with we're hopeful also with the results we have already um that we can get some funding that would allow us to do more just to review the the exact statistics i'm actually quoting from robin's book a democratic economic planning which i also contributed to um the exact average number of iterations um when not breaking those assumptions so just looking at the practicality question average of 6.5 iterations in order to reach a threshold of 5%. So a little more than 6. We were hoping for a handful, certainly less than 10 in the ballpark of about 5 to 7 and we indeed we did that. When trying to address the robustness question, there the average number came to 6.2. It was actually slightly better even when we were trying to break the system and um address uh, problems to make sure that the economy could handle even when we were um mucking with the assumptions. Right and and when you're mucking with the assumptions and you're testing robustness your real fear your real fear is you actually never get to you never get to a feasible plan right um and not in any I mean no matter how much no no, no matter how how strongly we broke some key assumptions that are supposed to prove that are supposed to cause these problems not one single time you know in any of our runs did we actually did the system break down and not reach a feasible plan and as and as Mitchell just said and it reached a feasible plan in the same amount of iterations that in the then before we broke the assumption then before we started violating the assumptions and we were trying and not just with a single like we were doing experiments with like very large scale economies um and many different experiments 40 experiments in all in fact that were right. done yeah to make sure that it's like you know uh, we didn't have any outliers here. Um Auntie, I'd like to get your thoughts regarding the question that I posed to Robin some moments ago regarding um could in trying to implement this, why not have a small country like say the country of Finland um to try to implement this? Um what are your thoughts regarding whether or not a country either very big or very small um could implement a participatory economy given the work done here and elsewhere? Well, I think it's definitely possible and a very viable option. Uh, uh, the discussion that you just had is a great example of that, I think. And that's what I think that in the future, the ideas of democratic planning will 
uh, emerge more and more as a feasible alternative, not in a sense of, you know, crushing capitalism. Uh, so I'm, I'm a little bit afraid that I think socialists will not gain that victory in, in sort of optics sense. But I think the a work done with participatory economy shows that, um, that it's feasible for a country to, to do it, and it would be more efficient. It would be more democratic. It would be, you know, for, for especially countries like, you know, the Scandinavian countries, which for a long time, in my view, have been built on basically anti-capitalist values to build, you know, systems that target and pinpoint the problems in capitalism and try to, you know, negotiate, build structures that alleviate and help, you know, fight back those problems. Um, and I think, you know, democratic planning would be a, you know, logical continuation of that. Um, I have to say that when we talk about simulations, um, something comes to mind, to my mind, and this is, of course, from Plato's Republic, <laughs> uh, <laughs> because uh, that's the first place uh, that the word cybernetics was used. And cybernetics uh, means, you know, the study of self-governance. So that's sort of, you know, ancient origins yeah. of the kind of not, not, ideas. Not the term where Norbert Wiener, the famous, um, well, a theorist and computer scientist coined a word and wrote a book called cybernetics, but it dates old, older than that, as you're saying. Yeah, it's, it's way older. And it originates from, from Plato talking about self-governance, that cities could govern themselves. And this then transferred into machines, the discussion on machines that could run themselves. But that's the origin of the word cybernetics. Um, and this all comes back uh, to our subject with democratic planning through Chile and INDES government there, which tried to implement project CyberSyn. Yes. Which was very early system of trying this, you know, system where you have inputs and outputs. You have basically, you know, producers and consumers, and you have all this data. Uh, yeah, I have that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm showing a copy of a book, Cybernetic Revolutionaries, Technology and Politics in Allende's Chile by Eden Medina. Th this is a yeah. book that is that, that talks about the point that Antti is raising of where uh, the Allende government in Chile in the early 1970s tried to use computers to help to plan the economy in Chile. Uh, their their yeah. mechanism wasn't so much using computers as using telexes, um, uh, um, uh, computational, um, how would you describe them as? Um, they're basically like a technical equivalent of a telegraph to be yeah. able to transmit messages. Yeah, um, inputs and outputs place. basically. That, right. that They tried to narrow down everything in the economy to inputs and outputs, but their main aims were the same as what uh, Robin talked about uh, in Cuba, that they sort of instantly recognized when they came into power, they recognized, okay, we're a socialist government trying to do, you know, this, you know, democratic thing here. And they instantly recognized that, you know, Soviet Union was never going to be a model for them. They sort of, they couldn't, you know, scream it out loud, but internally, the I and the government was that, you know, we won't get our economy working with any of those ideas. And they had the sense and the vision to try and, you know, work towards a version of democratic planning. Uh, a few years ago, I was in touch with one of the original engineers in that team. Mm. Uh, he was then a young Chilean engineer called Paul Espe uh, Rol Espejo, I think. Um, and he told me that uh, the interesting thing is that, you know, those that managed to escape the purchase uh, uh, afterwards, uh, when, when the Allende government was destroyed yeah. in 1973, um, they actually managed to create, uh, you know, build themselves a pretty, you know, credible and, and, you know, lucrative careers in cybernetics and computer simulation planning, because they had such early, you know, insight and practical knowledge of those systems. Um, and they've become, you know, pretty, you know, big figures on, on the field of cybernetics. You know, and, I'd, 
I think no. th there's a there's a name that I remember from that time period in in Chile named Stafford. Somebody named Stafford. Yeah, Stafford Beer. Beer. He was the uh, British engineer who headed he the was, project. He was a British engineer who consulted with the Allende government in the early years on exactly the kind of things that you're talking about. Yeah. It was. I mean, the 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 Allende government was not interested in the Soviet system. They weren't interested in the Cuban system. The Cuban system was in place by 72, 73. They were actively looking for something different, something that was more democratic, that was that was less clunky. Um, and Stafford Beer and the end, and and basically that was an experiment that was cut short, you know, by the Pinochet coup. Mm -hmm. um, and and it. I mean, what went on in Venezuela was very, very similar in terms of the people who the, the, the people who came to power, you know, through elections, just like in it, not just like in Chile, Chavez came to power through elections. They clearly wanted something that wasn't capitalism and they knew they wanted something that was not the centrally planned system, whether the Soviet or the Cuban system. And they were actively looking and searching. Um, and I think that what we are, I mean, we, we are slow. I mean, history moves slowly. <laughs> and what I think we have slowly made more and more progress, you know, in the direction of pointing out how you could go about doing the planning and sort of running experiments and simulations to sort of answer doubts about practicality, answer doubts about robustness. Um, and I think, I mean, if I if 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 I were if I thought of myself as a lawyer trying to make a case in a courtroom, I feel like we've been building this case for decades, and our case is getting stronger and stronger. Um, right. And at some point, there will be a government that'll come along, and you know, and they'll be able to sort of test it out further than it's ever been tested out before. Right. Yeah. And and uh, additionally, I also think that. Well, one thing I want to mention is that um, the engineer I talked with, he's now, I think, in his 70s uh, or late 60s, uh, but he worked with Stafford Beer in, in early uh, 70s. Um, and uh, he said that, you know, all their ideas, he still thinks that all their ideas are still very relevant. And throughout his career in cybernetics, throughout his career in computer, computer science simulation and so on, um, Yes, you know, felt that those original ideas and the problems that um, Allende government set out to, you know, solve creating a democratic economy are more relevant than ever. Uh, and I think, um, you know, it's it's very possible that, and I think, that especially countries, you know, highly developed countries like uh, Finland. Uh, are prime examples of that. And I I think in the coming years, as uh, climate change uh, will require more and more planning, very, you know, detailed planning of economies. When you consider, you know, everything that goes into building a car or or constructing a hospital and, you know, trying to account for all the uh, services, all the material requirements and everything and make that, you know, highly efficient, not just uh, when it comes to how you use the um, resources, but also how to, you know, you know, um, uh, to sort of answer the demand, how find, you know, where, when we have less and less, you know, concrete, for example, to use, when we have less, less and less battery materials to use, and we have hopefully less and less uh, emissions we can emit. Uh, that also constantly raised the question that we have to be more careful about where, you know, we allocate our resources. And this is exactly the kind of thing uh, that Ideas for Democratic Planning answers. So I think there's a, you know, there will be demand for this kind of thing. Mitchell, there's, there's one little piece of, of, there's one little technical issue that, that I want to make sure that we get into this podcast. Okay. Um, and, and it has to do with, well, hopefully at this point, people understand when we say an iteration in the planning procedure, our, our procedure is that all the workers councils and consumer councils make proposals. And every time they make a proposal, we call that an iteration. And then when iterate, when the when, when those proposals still do not result in a plan that is feasible, in the sense that 
not enough of something is being proposed to be supplied, you know, to to be sufficient to fill the amount of that's being demanded for that. So essentially, the when the proposals are not yet feasible, then there has to be a new round of proposals. All the councils have to go back and make a revised proposal and submit it again. So that's what an iteration is. And we're basically saying, well, yes, a legitimate question is how many iterations would it take in order to reach a plan? And if the answer is 2,000, that's impractical. If the answer is a half dozen, <laughs> that's not impractical. Um, there's two different things we did. Um, and I wanted to be clear about this. When we said that our results suggest and strongly suggest, because not one single time did we discover anything sort of remotely, you know, significantly different from six or seven or eight or four or five. All the results came into those range. There were no outliers yeah. in all the experiments that we ran. The, the range was five to eight in the first set, by the way, but go on. Right. And, but there's two different, the results also depend on the starting point. If you start from sort of, if you start from just some random indicative prices, sort of, and, and we started, I think, from, we, we just set all the initial prices for all the different things in the economy equal to 700. Then it takes longer to get to a feasible plan. If you start from an arbitrary set of prices, then I think our, our experiment said, well, then it might take maybe 18, 19, or 20 iterations to finally get to the point where we have a feasible plan. But of course, in the real world, you would never have to start for an annual plan with an arbitrary set of prices. You would clearly always begin with whatever the prices were from the last year's plan. And that's when, when you did that, and we basically simulated that in two different ways. We simulated how would you start from last year's prices and then how many iterations were it take? And it's when you, do, both ways we tried to simulate starting with the advantage that you already have prices from last year. And technologies and preferences only change so much over time. In a year's time, how much do all those things change? That's when we discovered that we're talking about a half dozen proposals and revisions rather than something like 18 or 19 or 20. Not that 18 or 19 or 20 would have you know, been outrageously impractical, but clearly you don't have to start from just a random set of prices each year. You always have the advantage of knowing what the prices were from last year. Yeah. And, and Robert is correct. And in fact, in the course of the research, we were, I was just using the convenient shorthand year one and year two to refer to, we're starting with an arbitrary price set and then finally arriving at a plan, which is going to be like in, in one demonstration I had given for a talk I gave, it came to 12. And then starting anew with the second year, year two, and then working from that, the number of iterations came to six, a marked improvement. But yeah, um, you're right that, and then also expanding that out and running that for dozens or hundreds of experiments. Yes, you will find that if you're starting anew, yes, it will take longer, but then you've got to start someplace in order to find that answer. So you try to figure out what you think is the best, best starting point, try to arrive at that, but then use that new revised and hopefully smarter approach um, to improve things. And yeah, there are research shows that once we arrive at that smarter place, things are much quicker. And, and the smarter place, I mean, there's an obvious smarter place, which is what were, the, what were the results from the previous year? Right. So in the real world, you always have a smarter place to start from basically starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so I just wanted to be clear that if anybody looked up our results and our experiments and they would see, well, sometimes it seemed to take 18 or 19 or 20. Well, that's when we were essentially making it as difficult as possible for ourselves by not taking any advantage of the fact that we know what happened in the economy the previous year when we're doing annual planning. When you take advantage of what you do know from the previous year, that's when our results indicate that, boy, this looks really practical.
<laughs> We've been talking with um, Auntie Haihuainen and Robin Hanel um, on Pep Talk, the podcast where we discuss the democratic alternative to capitalism known as a participatory economy. To find out more, you can visit the website of um, the Participatory Economy Project at participatoryeconomy.org. Uh, you can join the monthly newsletter as well as join an online forum for raising questions and discussions uh, of this and other topics. Um, I've been Mitchell Strapanchik. I'm your host from Chicago. Uh, thanks to Antti and from Helsinki and Robin from Portland, Oregon. Um, and thank you for listening and watching. Um, goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Could you please tell us um, what you see as the alternative? Self-management, democratic control of communities or workplaces, federal arrangements. Participatory democratic planning. Jobs down a mix of empowered your nesting councils linked to one Everyone gets to participate in a primary council. Please visit participatoryeconomy.org to find out more and subscribe to our newsletter. And don't forget to like the video, leave a comment, and subscribe to our channel. Thanks, and see you at the next episode.